Environmental Racism and Toxic Hazards in Indigenous and Black Canadian Communities. I think the focus on environmental justice in Canada actually obscures the issue of environmental racism. And I think partly that is due to the fact that naming racism is uncomfortable in Canada. A conversation with Ingrid Waldron. I'm Sean Courage, and you're listening to episode 69 of Nature's Past, a podcast of the Network in Canadian History and Environment. In recent weeks, political commentators and some Canadian politicians have questioned and even denied that Canada has a history of systemic racism. To most Canadian historians, however, systemic racism is an obvious and pernicious part of the history of this country. The same is true in Canadian environmental history. As environmental organizations like the Sierra Club, Environmental Defense Fund, and others come to terms with their own legacies of racism, environmental history as a subfield must also confront the ways in which racism is embedded in the histories we study. In Canada, this must begin with a better understanding of histories of environmental racism. The field of environmental racism emerged in the 1980s in the United States out of the Scholarship on Environmental Justice and the work of the Commission for Racial Justice. It examines the ways in which racism shaped inequitable exposures to environmental hazards and access to natural resources. In Canadian history, environmental racism is mediated through the structures of settler colonialism upon which the country was founded. Ingrid Waldron's book, There's Something in the Water, Environmental Racism in Indigenous and Black Communities, focuses on case studies of environmental racism in Canada, with particular attention to Mi'kmaq and Afro-Nova Scotian communities. This book inspired a 2019 Netflix documentary of the same name. To learn more about this history, I spoke with Dr. Waldron. My name is uh, Dr. Ingrid Waldron. I'm an associate professor in the School of Nursing in the Faculty of Health at Dalhousie University. Thanks for joining us, Ingrid, uh, to uh, come here and talk about uh, both your book, There's Something in the Water, Environmental Racism in Indigenous and Black Communities, as well as uh, the uh, subsequent documentary of the same name uh, that's out on Netflix now. Um, I wanted to just begin by uh, asking you to tell us a little bit about the origins of your research on environmental racism and your work uh, with the Enrich Project. Sure. Um, I came to Halifax and to Dalhousie in 2008, uh, fully expecting to continue the work that uh, I had done through my PhD and my postdoctoral work uh, at the University of Toronto, which focused specifically on the mental health impacts of discrimination experienced by Black women. So I had fully expected to continue that work. But uh, in 2012, an environmental activist uh, set up an appointment with me. And he, when he came to my office and we sat down and we, dis- we, you know, we sat down to discuss this kind of initiative or project that he wanted me to take on, he mentioned that it was about environmental racism, and I had never heard of the term and didn't know what it was. Um, So I asked him to explain it a bit, and he did. And uh, I was very hesitant initially to take it on uh, because I knew nothing about the environment um, and didn't uh, certainly didn't focus on that in my work, my doctoral work or my postdoctoral work. But, you know, I recognized that there was a connection to health and it was obvious that the communities that uh, were most impacted were black and indigenous communities. And I, you know, I had done work uh, on those communities. So I thought, well, you know, I, I'm a health researcher and there are health implications to environmental racism. And these are the communities that I actually prefer to work with. These are the communities I have experience working with. So I thought I would take on the challenge. Um, And I really felt it was a challenge because I thought that, in order to do that work, you needed to have an environmental science degree. So I, I believe that I had the wrong degree. I had uh, received my, my PhD in the sociology and equity studies in education department at the University of Toronto. 
And I just felt that I needed an environmental science degree. I didn't know anything about pollutants and contaminants and anything about water testing. So I thought, oh, I'm going to trip up. Somebody's going to call me out. And then I realized later that I actually, and any sociologist, has something really great to bring to this because um, I noticed that at Dalhousie and at other Canadian universities, the people who tend to be hired around this type of uh, focus or environmental work are environmental scientists. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was kind of a dominance of that type of framework where people were talking simply about pollutants and contaminants, but not connecting it to people. So I thought as a sociologist, as I learned more about the area, I said, well, I have a lot to bring, you know, there's race and colonialism and all the things that sociologists do well. And I didn't feel mm -hmm. that I was seeing enough of that in Canadian universities by scholars. So, and then I also had the community-based research aspect. Most scholars who are doing work in environmental science, environmental studies are not doing it from a community-based perspective. And while I did not have a lot of experience in community-based research, I didn't learn about that during my PhD. I, th I saw kind of different opportunities to put a little bit of a spin on this topic, to make it my own, uh, to create something that was unique. Uh, so I no longer have those you know, I don't have those fears and anxieties anymore that, you know, I don't have the right, the so-called right degree. <laughs> I recognize mm -hmm. that I bring something unique uh, to this topic. So that's how it all started, you know, with a lot of hesitant, I was very hesitant at the beginning. Um, but then I saw a challenge and the challenge excited me. Uh, so I said yes to the environmental activist. And there we go. I started the project in, uh, in October or, or fall of, tw of 2012. With the uh, first step was to kind of identify the communities that were impacted and to start build mm -hmm. start building a team. So I think one of the things that comes out in the book, uh, a point that you make is that um, you know w uh, the book, which is a study of environmental racism, uh, is that the topic seems to be underexamined um, in Canada. So I wondered if you might share with us, you know, some of the reasons you think uh, uh, that that environmental racism is an understudied topic uh, in Canada? Well, that's a difficult question. I think it might be a few things. Um, I'm not sure if people are familiar with the term environmental racism. It was coined in the United States in the mid-1980s. So to some extent, uh, American people are familiar with that term. So I don't think um, there's a lot of awareness around that term. But I think the focus on environmental justice in Canada actually obscures the issue of environmental racism. And, um, mm -hmm. and I think partly that is due to the fact that naming racism is uncomfortable in Canada. It's just a general kind of, you know, climate in Canada where people are very hesitant to talk about racism and name it. So when I started the, this work, um, I realized that people were using the concept of environmental justice, um, but by using that term, they were not pinpointing the causal factors for why people were impacted by uh, toxic burdens and communities of color, indigenous communities disproportionately so. So I think uh, it's a combination of a few factors. I think there was a lack of familiarity with the term environmental racism. When I started, certainly the environmental activists who met with me initially, you know, knew that term. He just, he defined that term for me because I had mm -hmm. never heard of it myself. Um, and there were people in his group, activists like himself, who were quite familiar with the term. But I think more broadly, when I think of the environmental uh, NGOs and environmental activists in Nova Scotia, less familiar with that term. But once again, also, I believe it's a kind of discomfort around naming race. So when I started the project, I said, I'm going to name race. I'm not only going to name it, but I'm going to center it. Um, because if environmental, uh, environmental activists are so focused on achieving environmental justice for Indigenous communities, then I'm wondering, are they asking themselves why? they're doing most of their activism in indigenous communities. Doesn't that say something? Doesn't that say something about mm -hmm. a racialized or indigenous community being disproportionately burdened by environmental toxins? I mean, one thing they must have noticed is that there's a pattern of environmental activists, you know, working in indigenous communities. Why indigenous communities? Why not white communities? So I just kind of wonder, you know, 
were they asking themselves that question? Because if they did, they would recognize that this is a non-white racialized community that continues to be disproportionately burdened by toxins. And to me, that speaks to the centrality of race. Um, yeah, so I, I said to myself that I need to center this and I need to kind of focus on the causal factors. And the environmental justice piece of it is about bringing about, bringing about justice, certainly, but you have to kind of determine what the causal factors are, uh, the condition, the illness, mm -hmm. before you prescribe the medication. You know, if the medication and the, you know, the tools to achieve environmental justice is, for example, environmental legislation, then in order to develop environmental legislation, the contents of that legislation, you have to be able to speak to the causal factors, right? You can't just drop environmental legislation without kind of identifying the causal factors. So if the causal factors have to do with, you know, the connection between the past and the present, colonialism and laws and, you know, the, 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 the ability of uh, settlers to just go into indigenous communities and do what they want. Um, mm -hmm. That's very much connected to historical factors um, and policies. And we have to understand how those, you know, those colonial policies have shaped present day policies. So, you know, th those kinds of issues need to be questioned and, and they allow us to kind of identify the factors underlying environmental racism. Then we can determine how to address it. So, yeah. I, and I guess it's not surprising now in recent days where we've seen political leaders in Canada either deny or have difficulty acknowledging the existence or even a legacy of systemic racism in Canada. Well, I'm of two minds about that. I think... Uh, there are some people who deny it because they really don't understand systemic racism. It's much easier to understand more overt forms of racism. But mm -hmm. I also believe that um, there's a lot of pretending going on. And I believe people are fully aware that there is, in, that, that there is racism and systemic racism. They understand what it is. But to admit that it exists means that you have to do something about it. And because you truly don't want to do anything about it, because you want to um, retain the privileges that you have, you then pretend that it doesn't exist. So I'm of two minds. I think there's enough kind of evidence uh, to indicate in Canada that there is systemic racism if you understand um, how to define it and you understand what it is. Um, mm -hmm. but I also think there's a good portion of people who do understand what it is, but um, suggest to other people that they that it doesn't exist or they don't get it because they're going to have to do something about it. So, yeah. So I don't think we have to keep continue to believe, uh, for example, politicians who say it doesn't exist. They just don't want to do anything about it. Right. Well, um, so I guess for listeners, um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about um, Nova Scotia and the ways in which environmental racism has operated as a form of state-sanctioned racial and gendered violence and provide some of the uh, examples of how Mi'kmaq and Black peoples are exposed to uh, environmental hazards uh, in the province. Well, we're using that term state-sanctioned violence and you know, racialized and gendered state violence uh, increasingly mm -hmm. these days. And it points, it points specifically to the state and more specifically to policies uh, that are meted out that in many ways harm marginalized communities disproportionately. So when I think about environmental racism, I think about how racist, classist, and colonial ideologies get, get written into environmental policies. In, environmental policies don't just happen. People write those policies and the people who have the opportunity to develop those policies are people from a particular racial um, and economic group. They're primarily white people, right? Working in government. So they get to write those policies and they get to do that from their own framework, from their own lens. And they, their lived realities are very different from the people who are impacted on the ground. So first of all, when we talk about state-sanctioned violence, we're talking about the harms, the violence of policies, the harms 
that are meted out to people on the ground through the policies that are developed. Um, and that is in every institution, not just with respect to the environment, but we can talk about state sanctioned violence in terms of housing and labor and employment and education and the healthcare system, the ways in which the people who get to make decisions and who get to make policies develop those policies in ways that can be harmful, but also in ways that exclude people. And the way that those policies impact people on the ground is, is often harmful. When we talk about state sanctioned violence in terms of its gendered and racial characteristics, and I think of the example of environmental racism, I think about how it specifically impacts, for example, indigenous women who are on the front lines of environmental justice organizing. So if racist and classist and colonial state policies around the environment um, uh, are impacting Indigenous women in very specific ways, I point to issues like health, where uh, Indigenous women uh, have high rates of cancer, have high rates of reproductive health issues. Uh, so their bodies, their physical bodies, are impacted in very specific and unique ways. But I also consider how they're impacted psychologically because these are the individuals who are on the front lines, mostly women. And indigenous women, women, indigenous women would say that this is part of their culture. They don't necessarily see it as a burden, right? Because it's part of their tradition to be on the front lines. They would say that we are the life givers. So it is our job to protect the water and the land. Uh, but we have, by, by looking at it in terms of it being gendered and racialized state sanctioned violence, it's about how do policies impact people on the ground in very specific ways um, to harm those individuals through those policies. And that's the violence. But it's also about the unique and specific ways, so the gendered ways in which those policies impact people. So there are gendered ways, for example, in which um, the body is impacted by environmental contaminants. So when we think of gendered ways, you know, that the fact that, for example, men are disproportionately, just this is an example, but men are disproportionately in certain occupations that would put them at risk or for exposure to certain types of contaminants and pollutants based on the kinds of work that men do, right? And then when we think of the segregated labor market, which is segregated by gender and race, and immigration status, we think about where are, for example, uh, immigrant women, when they first come to Canada, disproportionately located in the labor market. Well, they're in cleaning services, they are in, they're domestics in hotels um, mm -hmm. and hospitals, and that's going to expose them in very unique ways to certain contaminants and pollutants. So, um, mm -hmm. I think it's about being really specific about if you're really looking to examine these issues from an intersectional perspective, mm -hmm. then you need to think about state sanctioned violence in gendered and classed and racialized ways. And that's what I try to do in my book. You know, I, I talk about environmental racism, yes, but it's if, if you if you've read the book, you would see that it has a kind of strong gendered analysis uh, connected to race and to class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, and I think in some of the other like scholarship on uh, environmental justice, uh, you, you know, has pointed to um, you know the fact that it's women's groups are often some of the first to raise issues about toxic hazards in their communities as they recognize them uh, because of the effects on their children or the effects on uh, pregnancies, stillbirths, yeah. birth yeah. defects. Yeah. Uh, so women's bodies are exposed in different ways to environmental hazards. And one book that was really helpful to me is uh, Nadine Scott. I believe that's her name. I think she's at York University. But she wrote a book mm -hmm. called Our Chemical Selves. And actually, that helped me to think through the gender impacts of pollutants, because she talks about the body specifically and how, you know, we need to think about how contaminants impact the body biology in very specific ways for men and for women. Um, and for other gendered identities based on their location in society, where they're located in the, in the labor market, et cetera. So it's a really great book, Our Chemical Cells. Mm 
So I think your book and the the Enrich Project makes a really strong case for thinking about um, racialized space and its relationship to environmental racism. Uh, and listeners should go and look at the map um, that's on the Enrich Project website, uh, which I think if if there are sort of questions about uh, how environmental racism <laughs> operates, uh, the map is a really powerful way of demonstrating how indigenous and black communities in Nova Scotia are um, are uniquely exposed to hazards. Uh, and the map shows the locations of uh, waste disposal facilities, thermal generators, other toxic industries, and uh, indigenous communities and uh, African Nova Scotian communities. So can you talk a little bit about space and race in Nova Scotia and, and how this can help us think about environmental racism? Yeah, I mean, the really obvious way to look at race and space is kind of uh, connected to what you just said. You can look at a map and you can you can look at that map and notice that disproportionately uh, indigenous communities and black communities are close to particular toxic sites. So, you know, that's a spatial analysis of environmental racism. But what I wanted to do was to go beyond that in the book. Um I wanted to look at race and space and place more broadly, not just in terms of environmental racism or contaminants and pollutants, but to connect environmental racism to all other inequities that happen where we work, play, and live. And a spatial analysis allowed me to do that, to understand that environmental racism doesn't happen in isolation and doesn't happen independent of other oppressions or other inequities. So mm -hmm. when you apply a spatial analysis that's raced and gendered in many ways, it allows you to understand that environmental racism is just one piece of the puzzle, that you also need to connect it to other inequities that are happening in our spaces and places like employment inequities, criminal justice inequities, uh, police brutality, public infrastructure inequities, like, you know, the fact that some communities don't have sidewalks, that they don't have green space. So I think as I continue to do more reading, as I continued on with the project, I realized that it was important to broaden the concept of environmental racism um, beyond the focus on pollutants, which is what most people do, um, and, not, and not lose, you know, not lose the the distinctiveness of environmental racism and what I want to do, right? I, I, I am focused on environmental racism, but I felt that to look at the issue in isolation was problematic. And also, I think it engages more people in the topic of environmental racism when you can demonstrate that it's connected to so many other inequities. Um, and everything is connected. So uh, an analysis that looks at race, place, and space says that environmental racism manifests in conjunction with, in tandem with other inequities. Um, it doesn't happen in isolation, right? So what, one of the reasons why it's oftentimes easier to go into, for example, an indigenous community um, and take their resources or uh, place an industry, a hazardous industry in their communities is because these are communities that are also dealing with other, other social ills. So other social ills like missing and murdered Indigenous women, income insecurity and poverty, housing insecurity, food insecurity, and other social ills, right? So it's much easier to go and place an industry in communities like that that um, are, are dealing with um, other social inequities um, so if that's the case, then you need to be able to make a connection between environmental racism and those other inequities, because the fabric of those communities are often um, weakened sometimes by those social ills. And environmental racism and the placement of industries in those communities exacerbates many of those social ills, right? It it's compromises the vulnerability that some of these communities are already addressing. So if that's the case, it's really difficult to kind of separate environmental racism from poverty. And, and of course, that's the case because we know that people, communities uh, that are selected for the placement of toxic industries are typically communities that are dealing with poverty. 
They tend to be in remote areas, whether that's a reserve or an out of the way, more rural area, like for African Nova Scotians, tend to be dealing with income insecurity, housing insecurity, etc. So I think it's really important to have an analysis that actually connects connects environmental racism to other issues, to other human elements. Uh, That kind of intersectional uh, approach, I think, is really, it's important, but I also think it's much more interesting. For me as a sociologist specifically, this may not be something that an environmental scientist is concerned about, but as a sociologist, I am, of course, more interested in human beings than than, uh, a pollutant, right? So I I want to know how that pollutant impacts people on the ground and actions on the ground, but everything that actually impacts that person and that community. And that would be all of those social inequities. And even, um, you know, not only social inequities, but also communities have resources as well. They have strengths as well. Mm -hmm. You know, so I don't want to come from a kind of um, an analysis where I see them as weak. I want to come from a strength, I guess what I'm saying is a strength-based analysis, because, you know, these are communities that despite the fact that um, they don't necessarily have economic clout or political clout. They are powerful, as you saw in the documentary. And I try to document. Right. I try to document that in one of my chapters when I focus specifically on the history of mobilizing in Indigenous and Black communities. I wanted to show that these are powerful communities that have been acting against the placement of these industries for a long time. Right, and it's those communities that make the geography of environmental racism visible and have for decades. Yes. Um, so this is a podcast uh, about environmental history. Uh, and uh, I don't know if this is just my own reading as a historian, but it seemed to me that history kind of takes a, a central role in, in the analysis of environmental racism. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how you see history shaping environmental racism in the present. Well, the overarching framework uh, in the book is settler colonialism, which I thought was kind of apt for what I was discussing. And certainly when people discuss environmental racism today, um, they they typically like to talk about it as an example of settler colonialism. So there's a part of my book where I talked about, I talk about colonialism. Um, Mm -hmm. And I talk about the distinction between colonialism and settler colonialism. And basically what I was saying is, is that settler colonialism evolved out of colonialism. So what we see today, so the difference between both, of course, would be that with colonialism, you've got settlers or colonizers who return home, right? They return to the other country. They come to the new world and they return. With settler colonialism, there's no return home. There's no circular movement. They stay. They stay for the purposes of exploitation and profit and capital, right? So that was really important for me to look at the connections between colonialism and settler colonialism in that way, but also to demonstrate that what we see now, even though we call it settler colonialism, is the same kind of colonialism. It's about settlers uh, uh, or colonizers imposing themselves upon communities in order to exploit for resources. The same thing is happening, but what, uh, what happens today is that the, the, you know, these are activities that are shaped by what has happened before. They're shaped by colonial policies from the past. So when we think about, for example, the Indian Act, um, you know, people would often say, well, that's history. Why bring up history? But, his, you know, history, the past is the present, I always say. So what we're seeing today in these communities, it's informed by, it's shaped by the Indian Act still, right? Because there's a denial that these are the lands of Indigenous people. And this is what Indigenous people are fighting for. It's not just about environmental racism and trying to address uh environmental racism, but it's also about declaring that these are our lands and you just cannot come into our lands without proper consultation and do what you want in our communities. So in that way, it's very much an aspect of history. The Indian Act and um, other acts, I think I talked about the British North American Act as well. These these Mm -hmm. acts and policies continue to inform what's happening today. So settler colonialism is kind of a way to say that this is a new brand uh, a new kind of colonialism, but it, it operates in the same way uh, as mm-hmm. colonialism. Um, 
Yeah, so that I see that as the con, uh, as the connection uh, between the past and the present, and mm-hmm. settler colonialism was for me a really perfect uh, a perfect framework to discuss what's happening today. It it seemed to uh, in the book and in the documentary that um, in many ways the toxic legacies of the you know waste facility site in Shelburne or the um, uh, the effluent uh, disposal um, infrastructure in Boat Harbor, uh, you know these are these are infrastructures that are built in the mid twentieth century in the nineteen forties and the nineteen sixties. But the environmental legacies of that infrastructure, the kind of violence that is uh, instituted in the past, it happens every single day and persists right through into the present. That although maybe uh, the ways that policy acts or the way that people think changes over time, uh, those communities still live with the effects of decisions that were made decades ago. Exactly. And, uh, you know, while, for example, the the landfill in Shelburne was closed because of the activism of the community, it was closed in Mm -hmm. 2016, you know, the leaders there would say, yes, we did get it closed in 2016, but we're still dealing with the after effects, particularly high rates of cancer. You know, they would say that, yes, you know, even though the landfill is closed, we're still dealing with cancer. So you really can in all of these cases, you really can separate the past from the present because these communities are still dealing with not just the physical after effects in terms of illness, but the psychological after effects. And you heard that clearly from Louise DeLille in the movie. Mm-hmm. Where she talked about how her community was viewed and how they're still viewed, you know, Recently, she would, you know, recently she said that we are viewed as trash. We are viewed mm-hmm. as trash because we live near the trash. But the reason why they were selected for that landfill in the first place is because of those types of ideologies about African Nova Scotians in this province, right? So, in terms of ideologies and perceptions, those haven't changed that much, I would have to say. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a really good example of how we need to connect the past and the present. Um, and many of the issues that communities are still dealing with um, have everything to do with the fact that policies haven't really changed that much in Nova Scotia. Um, I want I want to make sure we have enough time to talk a bit about some of the policy action that you were involved in. Um, can you tell us a bit about the Environmental Racism Prevention Act, uh, how this uh, initiative originated, and and what what it tells you or suggests about the possibilities for redress or or addressing uh, the legacies of environmental racism. Oh, I um I think environmental le- legislation is really important. It's um an important piece of this in, in terms of, you know, addressing environmental racism. Um, and at the end of 2014, I thought I would start to, to connect with politicians, specifically MLAs. As I mentioned, I started, uh, you know, I started meeting with and developing partnerships with communities in 2012 when I started the project. And, you know, we did workshops in the communities and by the beginning of 2014, I thought now I need to share what I've learned with politicians. So I, I, I started to connect with politicians in the fall of 2014. And then around Christmas time of 2014, uh, I got a few responses. But the first person who responded was Lenore Zan. Uh, and we met for coffee. And she just seemed really keen to help. And she mentioned that we could we could develop a bill, a private member's bill, but she cautioned me. She, she said, these are bills that tend to not pass into law. So I don't want you to get your expectations up. I, I was just meeting with her to kind of figure out how she could help because I felt that, you know, I had reached out to various uh, government departments and I wasn't getting much of a response. And by the end of 2014, I thought I was chasing my tail and I was getting nowhere. I was very frustrated. And here was this this very enthusiastic woman really wanting to help. And she also didn't know what environmental racism was at that point. So she said, um, you know, I'm from, I'm from Australia. And when I was a little girl in Australia, I noticed that Aboriginal people always seem to be near a dump. Is that what you're talking about? And I said, yes, that's exactly it. <laughs> and then we talked about it a little bit more. And she says, well, let's do this bill. Once again, don't expect this bill to pass into law, but what it can do is bring a lot of attention to your project and bring a lot of attention to the issue of environmental racism. We can get people talking about it. And I said, okay, that sounds great. We actually introduced that bill in the House, in the uh, legislature, Nova Scotia legislature 
April 29, 2015. It was called uh, Bill 111, an act to address environmental racism. And uh, it did go to second reading later that year in November of 2015, but it, uh, it, it never passed into law, you know, so she was right. Mm -hmm. But what it did, <laughs> it, actually, it actually broadened the conversation about environmental racism. Yes, it was in the media. You know, it was all over the media. We had a press conference after she introduced it in the lobby of the legislature. And it was in all the papers and, and it was in the kind of lexicon now, environmental racism, environmental racism. When I started the project, you know, I had a lot of journalists ask me, what's that? Can you, can you define it, Ingrid? You know, it, it, people didn't know what it was. And after that press conference, it was kind of in the lexicon. And I don't get that question anymore. It's interesting. I don't get the question, what is environmental racism? So, so we decided that, or she decided that she would reintroduce that bill every year. And I've got to say, thanks to her. Thanks to Lenore, she mm -hmm. did. it was reintroduced every year up until 2018. She then left the NDP party for the Liberal Party, and she's now rather than being she's not an MLA anymore. She's now an MP, but still, mm -hmm. but still focused on environmental issues. So earlier this year in February, before the pandemic hit, she said, "Ingrid, what do you think about me using our old bill?" and and uh changing it a bit modifying it a bit and and you know once i do that i'd really like to introduce it in the house of commons as a federal environmental racism bill i'm going to try to get uh i'm going to try to get elizabeth may on board and other people in my party i really think i can do this so i looked at her kind of revised bill and i gave her some um feedback and she introduced the first federal environmental racism bill in the House of Commons on February 26. And she said, Ingrid, I already think this is getting to second reading. You know, I've got a lot of support and we were really excited. She said she was going to put it forward at the end of March of this year. And of course, then the pandemic hit. So mm. that halted everything. But, uh, you know, there was a recent Globe and Mail article that came out uh, this week or last week. Uh, she gave an interview. And apparently she's planning to put it to second reading in the fall of this year. So this is exciting for me because I think, you know, with these kinds of bills, it's really important to get uh, to kind of set out guidelines for government in terms of how to address these issues. And that's what these bills do. They set out mm -hmm. kind of guidelines or recommendations of what they must do in order to begin to address this issue. So legislation continues to be really, really important to me but i don't think it's i don't think i don't think with this particular issue there needs i need to rely on legislation because i can I, i've seen over the past few months what community mobilizing can do as well you know when i think of mm -hmm. the closure of the mill related to boat harbor and i think about what shelburne has done and i think about what the folks who are fighting against the Alton gas project has done, they, they've done those things without legislation. So right. while, in, while in the past I was really reliant on a bill, I thought the bill was going to solve all the problems. I now know that a lot of different things uh, coming together can help address this issue and not simply legislation. But I think I do think it's important to have legislation. I think it's important to have the first real environmental racism, or if you want to call it environmental justice, I'm fine with that. Environmental justice legislation mm -hmm. in Canada. We don't really have robust environmental justice legislation that centers the experiences of Indigenous communities and Black communities. And until we get something like that, I don't think all the other bills that have been developed are legitimate, as far as I'm concerned. I've seen other bills, uh, other environmental bills, and they do not center the perspectives or voices or experiences of people who are most impacted. And for me, if they're not doing that, then they're not robust bills. Well, I think that listeners uh, looking to better understand environmental racism, not just in Nova Scotia, but across Canada, uh, should pick up a copy of There's Something in the Water, Environmental Racism in Indigenous and Black Communities. Ingrid, thanks so much for telling us more about your work. Thank you very much for having me. Nature's Past is produced with support from the Network in Canadian History and Environment. This episode was made by Ingrid Waldron and me, Sean Kurash. Music for Nature's Past was licensed by Creative Commons. 
For details on the artists, please take a look at our show notes at niche-canada.org slash naturespast, where you can also download new episodes, subscribe to the podcast with your favorite podcast player, and leave comments. You can also follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash naturespast. You can always find out more about environmental history research in Canada from the Niche website at niche-canada.org. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back soon with another episode of Nature's Past. Thank you.